Now we come to the portion of the service before we get into our Bible study that we talk about some end times news and prophecy update as we do each week. And uh, we do want to welcome our online church and the subscribers around the world. Thank you for joining with us and partnering with us. When we talk about prophecy and we talk about the signs of the times, one of the key components that you always need to pay attention to what's happening in Israel, the issues going on in Israel. Over this last week, because of the escalation of the violence, uh, there was a suggestion um, out of the Times of Israel that John Kerry helped negotiate in trying to pull this thing off. Israel okayed this 24-hour uh, video surveillance over the Temple Mount. So they're okay with this around-the-clock monitoring, uh, where they would say it would provide a, a comprehensive visibility and transparency and uh, would be a real game-changer and discourage uh, anybody from uh, disturbing the sanctity of the holy site. And, um, but on the other side of it, you have the Palestinian authority that are rejecting the idea. And uh, they have some of their suspicions. Part of theirs, they think that uh, Israel would use the cameras uh, to arrest the Palestinians under the uh, pretext of incitement. And that's just uh, an eye-opener right there because that's exactly what's happening. And uh, a report that came out of the Washington Post uh, said that the cameras in Jerusalem, uh, again on the Temple Mount, would prove to be too controversial. So it seemed like a good idea the previous week. A lot of people would be for it. But uh, you have the Palestinians that would say, no, we don't want that. And that's where the devil's in the little details. And um, part of it would, their other suspicion would be that it's um, infringement on religious privacy. But um, having these cameras, you would really see what's happening, right? And uh, people, the Palestinians don't want the, the truth to really be exposed to the world. Because then the truth would come out how um, the Muslims are provoking and attacking the Jews, they're the ones doing it, but yet Israel gets blamed for defending themselves. So that's one of the key reasons why uh, the Palestinians do not want uh, the cameras to be showing what's going on. But it's also one of those thoughts, and at some point something's going to happen because the Revelation chapter 11 talks about how these uh, two witnesses that are going to be preaching in the streets, and uh, they get killed, their bodies lying in the street for the whole world to see. So you have some sort of camera going on 24-7 where the world is going to be celebrating like Christmas time uh, when these two witnesses get killed. And so this could be one of those pretexts to a setup to having this camera going on. It could be any other camera for that matter as well. But you can start to see the talk of some of these uh, negotiations taking place. Also, what's interesting, where you see the heart of some of the family members of the Palestinians, uh, they, uh, Monday this report came out on the Telegraph that the Palestinian family named their baby the Knife of Jerusalem. What a pleasant name. Friendly, peaceful name for a baby, huh? And uh, they, they did it with the solidarity of the Palestinians who stabbed Israeli soldiers and civilians in the recent weeks. And so uh, the father said that th this is the least I can do to show support uh, in the uprising in Jerusalem and the occupied West Bank. And he says that Allah had given him this particular name. And I've named him Knife of Jerusalem after the infatata of the knives because we are now witnessing a new kind of revolution. And again, the current violence that's been going on, it's uh, nicknamed the Infitata of Knives uh, because the knives have been the weapon of choice uh, and, uh, for many of these young Palestinians, um, assailants. So it's just one of those things to keep in mind. You're starting to see the hatred, the indoctrination, even to uh, a whole nother level. Dealing with some of the refugee, this report came out a couple weeks ago, but it's just important to keep in mind what's going on with the refugee issue, so-called refugee issue going on in Europe. Uh, and this is good on uh, Hungary for closing its borders uh, to refugees to preserve Christian values, according to the report. And um, they're shutting its border to Croatia, uh, forcing migrants to divert to the Slovenian border crossing. Uh, Part of the, that, that uh, idea was to protect the Christian values because what you're seeing is this whole Islamic invasion coming in throughout Europe. Uh, Budapest, again, opposes the European Union that plans, plans to house 
uh, 120,000 refugees among the European Union. And Hungary officials said they want more protection along the border of Greece. And Slovenia has been taken up to over 8,000 migrants a day as the people are fleeing uh, to Austria and Germany. Now, these countries that have opened the doors, have you seen the crime rate grow up? Have you seen the violence off the charts? And the rape has been happening astronomical numbers with the women and children because of this. But these are some of the things you're not going to hear about or read about in mainstream media. But this is the facts and this is what's happening in those countries that have opened up the doors. And most of these guys that are coming in refugees are men. The women and children are still in these other countries, but the men are coming in. So it's happening all over Europe. The main places, again, um, Sweden and Germany and France are the big key factors with all this as well. They're going in in the droves into uh, England as well. There's a great visual to see um, the uh, impact. And it's uh, a website called 100percentfedup.com. What a great website. But there's where you can see this transformation with this invasion coming into Europe. So you can pick a country and you can see the number of people heading into different countries. And then, uh, but uh, the full scale back, you're just seeing just floods of people coming in all throughout Europe. Uh, as we mentioned, France is one of those places. But we're also seeing the war against Christianity uh, being waged all over Europe as the Islamic Caliphate uh, rises. France has now been demolishing churches. And in the place of that, they're building mosques. And uh, so the France is a self-destructive de- demonstration of the commitment to making a flood of Muslims uh, insurgents feel right at home by tearing down historical churches and allowing the conversion of many of them into mosques. Uh, a report out of the Bulgarian Times, the historic Christian institution and churches are being allowed to fall to disarray as government funds are repairing uh, or drying up. The money that normally would be allocated to repairing the churches are being directed to building the mosques. So the clergy, as well as other organizations that protect the monuments and landmarks representing French culture, apparently are powerless uh, to influence what's happening. Your hands are tied behind your back. You can't do anything. Frustrating, difficult. And by the way... The Islamic war that's going on in, in France has already conquered portions of the, the territory inside of France are now called in what is called no-go zones by French authorities and citizens. So they're, they're taking over the country. Uh, the UP uh, or EU officials are now concerned uh, with the religious demands of the Muslim population. So they're bowing down to these people. It's also an interesting article that came out of European Guardian. And it was... Uh, it, a piece that kind of uh, developed over time, but uh, there was a guy in the early 1900s, uh, Kel Gurry, and his ideas are now being guided to implement uh, in principles with the European Union. So way back then, some of his principles are coming to pass and uh, what he uh, thought and his ideas. Uh, part of the article was even dealing with the uh, immigration issue. Um, and that's what you're seeing around the world with countries. With the, because of the dying and aging population, you got to uh, replace it. And so part of the idea here was to accept millions of immigrants uh, because of the low birth rates, especially within the European Union. And the report that was published in 2000, January 2000, the Population Diversion Review, the United Nations in New York, under the immigration replacement, a solution to the declining aging is that Europe will need, by 2025, so in 10 years' time, 159 million migrants. That's a lot of people. Most of these are Muslim, by the way, that are coming in now. But you're seeing all these chess pieces in Israel and in Europe and the the governments and the UN and the NATO issues that are going on. The pieces are coming together. And it's been years in the making, but we're seeing things unfolding right before our eyes. These European leaders, they're not stupid. They're following orders. They're on the same page with the New World Elite along with Australia, along with America, along with all these other countries, they're obeying the orders that they're commanded to do. And then finally, uh, 
The United States has a new House Speaker, uh, Paul Ryan. He was the Vice President nominee uh, a couple of years ago in 2012 with uh, Mitt Romney. Uh, again, they didn't get in. Um, but he uh, replaced outgoing John Boehner. And uh, he, he began his term with an act of grace. And uh, he called for reconciliation among the warring factions and backed it up with a promise. And he just told it like it is. He said, hey, let's be frank. No, his name's Paul, not Frank. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, the house is broken. We're not solving problems. We're adding to them. I'm not inve- we're, we're, we're not uh, in, in interested in laying blame. Uh, we're not settling scores. We're wiping the slate clean. And he began with saying, hey, we should be praying for each other. So that is his heart. Hey, we need to be praying for each other. And he also admonished both Democrat and Republican to pray uh, to gain a deeper understanding of both parties. And you're seeing such a division that's gone on within the nation. Uh, and again, he says, today's a new day in the House of Representatives. And again, we're turning the page. Uh, we're not going to have the House look like it was the, uh, over the years. Uh, you know, we're, we're going to move forward. We want to unify. And that's the right vision. You've got to unify uh, with the strength and with fresh vision. And I'm reminded of the verses that Jesus says, a house divided will not stand. That goes for the home, it goes for the church, and it also goes for the government. You see why nothing gets done within the governments, because it's all divided. And as we mentioned in previous update, how the world, how uh, the nations are hungry for leadership. There's a starvation of good leadership these days, godly leadership especially. And uh, but I, I like the way he starts out his term in office, you know, hey, the importance of prayer. And uh, he's a man of faith as well. And like every leader, every church, every government, they need prayers. And it is our command in Scripture to be praying for our leaders, um, both here in the church or whatever church you call home, uh, your local council, state and federal. We need to be praying for these people. Uh, pray for wisdom, pray for discernment, pray that they would make the right choices Pray for protection. Pray for their families and their marriages. Uh, Pray for their salvation. And God would open their eyes and that they would become born again. And uh, when you become a leader, you have this target and this bullseye on your back. Whether you're in the church or whether you're in the business or whether you're in the government, people are going to attack you and criticize you. And so they need your prayers. Amen? And that concludes today's update.